happens. There comes a point where the game changes, where it's not just about working hard, it's about working smarter. Business is my game. And so when I see the money coming in, that is my score. Take ownership of it, be accountable, and then deliver your checklist and it will, it'll happen. You just, just be yourself. Don't, don't dress it up. Too many people like to talk. And what happens is when you talk, you drown out all the stuff around you. You're listening to The Remote Revolution Show, the show that brings insights from industry experts across the world of digital business, so you too can take your business online, travel the world, and live with freedom. If you're new to the show, the podcast is produced every Tuesday for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at www.remoterevolutionshow.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the show to your favorites in your YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes feeds. If you want to follow us on social media, which you should because we're awesome, join the community by searching for at Remote Fit Pro, where you'll find daily content to help you explore the remote revolution oh yeah and if you want to connect with us individually you can do that too via the links in the show notes now let's get into this week's episode with your hosts james moody and george crawshaw hello welcome back to the remote revolution show today we are so so excited to bring you daniel Priestley. this man we have followed for a very long period of time and he is he has got a lot of great things to share this episode he really goes in deep with what it takes to be an entrepreneur and and sort of the background things that happen with successful entrepreneurs just like daniel all right so if you don't know who daniel Priestley is he's a best-selling author he's written four books all of which we have read implemented the strategies from and actually got success out of many, many of those strategies. A lot of them strategies dictate how we run our business today. All right, at the age of 21, Daniel started his first business and in the first year made $1.2 million. And he further went on before the age of 25, had a multi-million dollar event market in a management business. And uh, he sold companies pretty much all around the world Australia, Singapore, UK. He's now the founder of Dent Global, which runs a nine-month growth accelerator program for small enterprises. And they have worked now with thousands of entrepreneurs, they work with 500 plus each year to develop their businesses. All right, he has written one of the books that we give out to every single one of our members. That's the key person of influence. And we dive into that today as well as his backstory and what he did that set him up for success every step of the way. So I I really do hope you enjoy this episode. I absolutely loved it. It was it was a great opportunity to interview this guy and and really get into his head. So without further ado, let's go and get into today's episode. So Daniel, welcome to the Remote Revolution show. We really appreciate you taking some time and uh, spending an interview with us super excited to get how, to talk to you man how many of those how many of those bottles of wine have you drunk uh we've been in spain now for so our team lives in spain proper remote yeah. revolution entrepreneur revolution style that's been a couple of weeks two weeks yeah. it's a bo- bottle of night yeah when, <laughs> when in rome when in rome exactly um, yeah so uh no it's 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 good it's the spanish life is is nice tap us and wine yeah, that's it. And you live, you you guys are living the entrepreneur revolution life now. Yeah, hundred percent. We made that step. Cool. We can't. We literally cannot wait to get into that because I'm sure it will un, unravel. And obviously, Daniel, I met you in London recently, but so much of our journey has been inspired by your work. So we can't oh, wait wow. to like an, an enormous amount. So we can't wait to share with our audience All who right. are always I'm, promoting you. I'm kind you of scared to. to see what it is that I'm now going to take credit for. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. So better, this, all better, this experiment better work out well, guys. Because <laughs> now, now, now if it doesn't, I'm to blame. <laughs> Not at all. All right, so let's get into it. George, I think you've got some questions lined up, eh? I do, yes. So, Daniel, we wanted to kind of start with a bit of your backstory because we find that the most intriguing as, as to where we are in our journey. And, you know, you launched your first business when you were 21. Yep. You did 1.3 million in your first year with a team of four. How were you, how were you able to do that at such a young age? So I had had um, two years of phenomenal mentoring with a guy called John. From 19 to 21, I worked, uh, I was employee number three on John's team. So I'd, I'd actually had the experience of beginning with four people. Uh, we, John built that business into a $6 million business in two years. 
Um, and I had this incredible opportunity to ride shotgun on all of that. So I basically um, was involved in marketing decisions and scripting sales conversations and um, uh, running launch campaigns and promotions, choosing products, um, all of this sort of stuff that you kind of wouldn't normally be doing at 19. Um, I was involved in all of it. So I, I had this amazing um mentorship you know to shadow a great entrepreneur for two years um, and then at the end of two years we had a little bit of a falling out i had in year one i had spun out a new division of the company um, which was a regional division john's business was mostly brisbane sydney melbourne i set up this little regional side of the business which did um, geelong bendigo hobart like smaller towns and it was very profitable i'd made six hundred thousand dollars worth of sales in year one and made $175,000 worth of profit in year one. And I went to John and said, hey, look, you know, here's my P&L. This is what I've done. Um, can I get some sort of a bonus? And in my head, I had a number like 20 grand or I don't know, some, something something was kind of like, I thought I've made 175,000 in profit. Maybe if I got 10% of that as, as a profit share, that would be really cool. Um, and I might've gone to him saying, you know, what about 20 grand? And he's just kind of reacted badly and gone, listen, the company is not going to pay you 20 grand. You've had an amazing opportunity to start this. Um, you know, that's, that's the, that's the reward in itself. And being a cocky 21 year old, I, I sort of went, look, you know, maybe I could get some shares in the company. Uh, maybe I could be a shareholder. And he had this moment where he said, listen, if you want shares in the company, you go start your own company. And, uh, and I was like, cool, maybe I will. So that actually, um, that actually led me to step out and start my own company. But it, it kind of makes more sense when you think about four, you know, four people, year one, 1 1.3 million. I basically went out and did what I was doing anyway. Um, and I did it with uh, two or three of the people who I was working with anyway. So we all left together. I convinced them to quit their jobs and come and join my rebel gang. Uh, and um, we just continued the process. And basically, I selected my own product and my own speaker, but it was all very similar to what I was doing with John. Um, and I ended up, um, you know, what in year one, we did 600 grand for John, and we were on track that we now had enough skills that we could have doubled that. So we did. Um, and basically, I ended up doing 1.3 million and 400 grand in year one. Um, so, uh, with, with a small little ragtag rebel gang. Amazing, man. So we're going to talk about that team shortly because George's role in our business is all about growing the team. He's the integrator. And we're really interested to see how you make that transition of going from a solopreneur to a team. But before we do, I'd love to delve into that lifestyle that you were living in your early twenties in a lifestyle business. Cause I know you speak about this <laughs> and it'd be great to explore the different types of business models that people run going through that entrepreneur journey for the audience. I really don't want to bring it up. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a I, I'm a dad now. I have three children, and uh, a you don't get to have that kind of fun when you're a dad. Uh, and and b my kids in 15 years time are going to listen to this and then use it as an excuse that the dad you did it. Um, you can imagine what kind of lifestyle I lived. I was 22, 23. By 24, 25, we were making a million dollars a month in sales. Um, you know, I bought a big flashy BMW X5 and I lived in a massive house and we partied nonstop and we would just basically go to the top nightclubs in town and, and rent a booth and take the whole team out. Every, every one of the team was under 30. Um, so we worked hard, we partied hard, we... Uh, traveled all the time so we were uh, in 2005 we ran 174 events in one year so it was an average of three or four a week um, each event had about 200 people in it um, and we were up and down between Brisbane Sydney Melbourne um, and it was wild you know it was just a, 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 an amazing time an amazing early 20s um, I started the business in a four-story townhouse um, and ended up you know, ended up with great, great places, great properties, lots of, you know, lots of cash, lots of fun, lots of stress. Like, oh my God, like don't underestimate 174 events in a year is not just like, oh, let's just turn up to events. That's, it was just nonstop craziness. Um, 
And we had a team that was all young and all earning a lot of money and all, you know, kind of living large. So um, a lot of, you know, a lot of crazy stuff. And all kind of, one of the experiences that kind of brought it crashing to an end was um, one of the guys on, on the, we were in partnership with another company and one of their guys was about 120 kilos of muscle, ex-personal trainer. And he was six and a half foot. And he was so drunk one night we were staying in a 76 story penthouse apartment and he decided he was so drunk and pissed off that he was going to run through the glass and jump out the window. And he ran into the glass, smacked himself out and fell backwards. Thank God. You know, the whole room went quiet for a second when he ran at the glass. And, and that actually was a moment where I just went, this is all too out of control. This is, this is just gone crazy. Um, and that was when I started thinking, um, time to time to make some big changes. So it really was rock and roll lifestyle. The kind of stuff we read in Branson's autobiography, similar kind of things. Mm, well, look, Branson was in the music industry. I'm sure he absolutely <laughs> was way more rock and roll than me, way cooler. Um, you know, most of our team were guys, um, and uh, you know, we were involved in much more boring business. But uh, but yeah, look, it was it was a great time. It was a lot of a lot of um, great lessons and, and and interesting experiences. And you know, at a very young age, I'm I'm dining out at Michelin starred restaurants and staying in the best hotels. And you know, um, we took you know great experiences like just dropping everything and taking a 56 foot yacht around Vanuatu and um, you know, cool cool shit, cool stuff. Yeah. Very cool stuff. And so recently we, we saw you at Gary V in London, the event in London where Gary V came out and it, that was awesome. Um, but we wanted to ask you, is there any other influential entrepreneurs that you s sort of look up to or spend your time with on your journey that, that maybe got you to where you are today? Yeah. So I, I've always had great mentors. One of the mentors I had was, you know, I told you about for those first two years, um, uh, I was mentored. I was very fortunate to be mentored by a guy who built three multi-billion-pound businesses. Um, a guy called Mike Harris. When I came to London, I was mentored uh, by I was mentored by a guy called Roger Hamilton, who had built a global business um, called Wealth Dynamics, and I was very instrumental in scaling that. Um, and then I was mentored by a guy called um, John D. Martini, um, who we did work with, and he really kind of took me down a personal development rabbit hole. Um, and then uh, Mike Harris, who set up three multi-billion pound businesses, two banks and a telecommunications company that each were worth more than a billion. Um, so, you know, phenomenal mentoring um, all the way through and just, you know, really good fortune to, to meet and to spend time with those kind of people. Yeah, I find the diversification amazing in your journey because when I read your books, it's clear you've been exposed to so many different environments. I know some of that's from your own making. You've traveled an awful lot and you've been on planes nonstop, all this kind of stuff. But when seeking a mentor, how important do you think it is to think outside of your current industry? Well, all of my mentors are people I've done business with. So um, basically, you know, John, I was running a division of his business and I was on his sales team initially. Um, and then Roger, I was launching his product into um, into the UK market. And then uh, Mike Harris, I was handling his book launch. He'd written a book called Find Your Light Bulb. And um, I approached him to run his book launch um, and to kind of help him, you know, run a series of seminars and series of talks um, about his journey and his story. And I guess for me, just being a young guy in my, uh, you know, 20s, I it probably naturally formed that, you know, guys who are 20 years, 30 years, 40 years older than me would want to take me under their wing a bit, which was cool. Um, but also I kind of encouraged it in the sense that I would say, would it be okay if we, you know, can I, can I talk through a current challenge or a current problem that I'm having um, that you might be able to help me with? And, you know, I just kind of, I never really said, will you be my mentor? It was just, it was just kind of, um, having opportunities to have regular chats and what, you know, just asking questions like what should I be thinking about um, now that, now that the business is at this stage, what should I be thinking about next? And, and those, those kind of things just evolve naturally. And I said, essentially someone I call a mentor today is someone who I had a set of, pro, you know, prolonged intervention conversations with over the course of maybe a year or two years and we would at least talk like that on a monthly basis. And that that's who I refer to as a mentor. But there was never a, 
you know, will you be my girlfriend kind of moment. <laughs> <laughs> in first school kind of moment. Amazing. So, Daniel, you alluded to, alluded to it there where you talk about environment and you put yourself in the vi- right environment. I know you're a big proponent of, of environment dictating performance. Can you, can you delve into that a little bit and maybe share some light on how first-time entrepreneurs or people new to the space, because we help fitness professionals set their business online, how these people who are brand new into that industry can start to improve their environment? <laughs> So the the idea environment dictates performance is essentially there are no such thing as good people or bad people. There's we, we all come hardwired with the ability to be uh, distracted and procrastinate. We become hardwired with the ability to work hard. We're hardwired with the ability to put in long hours or to get incredibly creative. <clears throat> so all of that's built in. But it's the environment that brings out different elements of who we are and our personality. And the, the reason I know that is because um, a couple of reasons. Personally, I've experienced it, but I've also done work with a charity that works with drug dealers coming out of uh, prison. And these young guys, uh, you know, early 20s, they're running six-figure businesses. They're, you know, they're running teams of 10 to 20 people. Uh, handling large amounts of cash, no software or banking facilities, um, dangerous kind of environment, uh, 24-7 business, huge customer service expectations, um, very difficult to manage supply chain. And um, and these guys run these types of businesses. And what you discover pretty quickly about them is many of them, had they been brought up in any different environment, would have been out there building a very successful seven-figure, eight-figure business. The amount of drive, personality, spark, creativity, uh, passion that they bring to that role, um, if it had been placed in anything that was socially acceptable or legal, you know, they would have built a very, very, very successful business. But they all share one thing in common, which is a particular type of upbringing and environment. And the environmental factors that I look for is uh, environment has four elements to it. Number one is the sharing of best practice, so the sharing of strategy. Um, So these young drug dealers were shared at 14. They were taught strategies on how to deal drugs. There was a sharing of best practice. Now, there was no sharing of best practice on how to set up a technology business. There was no sharing of best practice around how to go off and, um, you know, get accepted into Cambridge University, right? It was a sharing of best practice about that particular skill. Um, the second thing in any environment is a community of um, peers and mentors. What are your peers doing? What are your mentors doing? Um, and in that environment, their peers are all dealing and their mentors are all dealing. So peers and mentors are reaffirming that this is a good idea. Um, the third environment uh, factor is access to resources. So is someone willing to fund you? Is Are you getting the tools that you need, the resources that you need in order to do this thing? So it's one idea to say, I would love to start the next Facebook. Do you have access to Peter Thiel? Do you have access to 500 grand loan um, from one degree of separation from you? Um, Do you have parents who are paying for you to go to Harvard University in a dorm room that's paid for while you experiment with technology that doesn't pay off immediately? So access to resources change the environment. And then the final one is accountability. Um, So um, accountability uh, is measuring um and consequence is also part of that so accountability and consequence that you measure and there are impacts based on what gets measured so when you combine these four forces um uh you get an environment and that environment changes you so if i took anyone off the street and i give them more resources more strategy and best practice um, a peer group and mentoring and accountability and consequence and i surround them with those ingredients you'll see a radical shift in who they are and what they what they achieve. And this flies in the face of personal development. It flies in the face of this idea that some people are good and some people are bad. It flies in the face of what most successful people believe about themselves. Most people who are rich want to massively discount the role of luck that played in their life, and they want to massively discount the role of environment. They want to believe that they would have been uh, you know, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, had they been born anywhere? And it's like, no, you wouldn't have. Um, they want to believe that they would have set up a $10 million technology business had they started in an East London council flat. No, you wouldn't have. Um, so, you know, the f- thing for me is that I'm, I, I hugely acknowledge the role luck has played in my life. 
And I hugely acknowledge the role that environment has played in my life. And other than that, I'm a really ordinary person who found found myself in a good environment. You know, I made decisions. I made decisions about what I would do with that. And I'm really, you know, probably based on environment, right? <laughs> probably based on my upbringing. Um, but uh, but a huge, you know, at least two thirds of my success is luck and um, the right environment. Is that not disheartening, though, for the people who are, as you say, coming out of prison for drug charges? Is it not disheartening for the entrepreneur who's born into the family of one single parent who's living off benefits? Because it sort of goes against what a lot of we hear. And again, we spoke about Gary Vee earlier and being like, just hustle. You can make it work. You're in a gifted generation, which I, I fully agree we are. We're in an amazing well, let's, place. Well, let's, pause, let's pause there, right? So Gary, and God bless him, I love him, right? But G- Gary, Gary started with a $3 million business. Right. So Gary had a family business. That business had doubled seven times in 15 years. So his father had started with near nothing and started a business that might have done 25 grand and built it to 50 and then 50 to 100 and then 100 to 200 and then 200 to 400, 400 to 800, 800 to 1.6, 1.6 to 3.2. Enter Gary. Right. Now, Gary takes over a business that has supply chain. Gary takes over a business that has loyal employees who have been there for 10 years. Gary takes over a business that has oversight, mentoring, um, has finances, has cash in the bank, has products on the shelves, right? So all of that stuff is done and it takes 15 years to get done, right? And then Gary adds to the element email marketing. He adds to the element video marketing, social media marketing. He adds to, you know, he adds fresh fresh energy as well, um, coming clean off the bench, uh, picking up a $3 million business and then scaling it up. But but have a look at what happened. 3 million to 6 million, 6 to 12, 12 to 24, 24 to 48, right? So four or five doubles. Now the business had doubled seven times already every two years for 15 years. And then it doubles again another uh, four or five times in 10 years. Roughly speaking, it just kept doubling. So it doubled every two years for 15 years and then it doubled every two years for the next 10 so hats off to Gary. Gary's done really well. But, you know, and, and look, Gary, Gary's nuanced, but it's very easy to interpret that part of his message is like, oh, you know, look at me, how, how hard I hustled, and I've ended up with a tens of millions of dollars worth of business. I think it's just as, e- it's just as important to recognise, and I'm not saying Gary doesn't, but it's just as important to recognise that it's hard to take a 50 grand business to 100 and it's hard to take that from 100 to 200 right and there's pieces of the puzzle that have to happen all the way along the all the way along the line um and don't if you didn't start with a three million dollar business uh at age 18 don't compare yourself to gary as far as the numbers are concerned right and don't expect that also don't expect that hustle will pay off because someone someone ran the first 15 miles of that marathon Mm. I think perspective then is a big key attribute to have. And I've heard you speak about before, if you were to look at KPI again, and let's say that's written 10 years ago now, KPI, the, the book, Key Person of Influence, which is incredible. And anyone out there who's listened to our podcast already will know we've referred to it a hundred million times. So please go and get Key Person of Influence. Um, yeah, I think Daniel, we've done half your marketing for you on that book. <laughs> but that is, it's an amazing book, so we can't do anything else, but you know, share it. But you talk about potentially adding perspective as a final P into that formula can you talk us through the formula of the kpi method and then why you've spoken before about the perspective piece yeah so um so the five p's in the book is is so where the book came from is spending time with uh, roger hamilton and the very genesis of the book was spending time with roger hamilton and mike harris um doing a speaking tour from manchester down to london where we did manchester birmingham milton Keynes, london 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 you know so it was about 10 events in one week and um what what blew me away when I was doing that uh, road show with them is that the non-stop opportunities that are just dropping in their lap all the time. So as soon as you elevate and you're a key person of influence, as soon as I put someone in front of 500 people on the stage every night of the week for, for 10 nights in a row, um, people are, th- are thrusting business plans. People are like, hey, I've got this domain name. Can you help me sell it? Uh, I've raised 500,000 from investors. Can you help me spend it? Um, can I give you 10% of my company in order to be a mentor to the business? 
right? Like it, it's incredible just the the speed of opportunities that are just coming in nonstop. And it's also just stuff like, hey, we're having a conference too. Can I pay you ten thousand dollars or ten thousand pounds to just speak at this conference that's twenty minutes from your front door? Um, you know, so all of that stuff is just nonstop. Um, and then funny things happen, like some dude will come up and say, hey, look, I've got this business plan or business idea I want to share with you. And they're like, okay, a big, you've got to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And it's like, honestly, if you saw behind the curtain, if you saw what goes on behind the scenes, forget about non-disclosure agreement. These guys won't remember in five minutes' time what the fuck you talked about because they're, the next opportunity is landing in their lap and it's just nonstop again, 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 again. And I remember thinking unless you're that you can't possibly succeed like you can't hustle anywhere near the scale that you need to hustle to create that level of attraction of opportunity so i remember thinking if you're not a key person of influence your full-time job should be to become one you should actually build it's a completely different set of skills and i also here's the other side of it i also spent a lot of enough time with roger and mike to recognize they're just ordinary guys they're just they are just normal people when I say normal, above average IQ um, would would absolutely be the case. Both of them are intelligent, very intelligent. Um, you know, they're both good communicators, but they're not exponentially. You know, they're not. They might a normal person might have an IQ of 100, and they might have an IQ of 140 or something. But they're not exponentially like tens of times. They're just, you know, they they're just uh, normal guys, fairly normal guys. They're not remarkable kind of you know super powers but um anyway so i looked at what they're doing i'd had a lot of exposure to this world so the the key things that all of them have in common is they're very good at pitching ideas they've published content or published a book in particular they have several products that make money around them um so it's not necessarily their time for money that is making money they're, they're just by showing up and just by talking and just by being there money's changing hands around them so they have products uh they've got a good profile um, and they guard their reputations um, and they do partnerships and joint ventures um as the main thing that they're looking for is partnerships and joint ventures where they can leverage their assets against someone else's assets so those are the five p's perspective is the one that you start with which is to recognize you're already standing on a mountain of value um, and to stop looking at the damn thing that's across the table, stop stop thinking. So, like, you know, every, everyone has an interesting story. Whether you started out as a, you know, Australian who ran a garage sale at age 10 or if you started out as um, someone who inherited a wine library business or if you started out as someone who got into the music industry early and sold the business to buy an airline, like, these are all these amazing stories, but actually when you hear a lot of successful people, their stories start pretty simply anyway. So they're good at telling their story. The difference between a lot of these key people of influence and people who aren't is that they've recognized that their story is valuable. They've recognized that they're sitting on some sort of valuable insight. Um, maybe it's a little bit of narcissism or self-confidence that some people have less of, but I, you know, the, the stories are often not that brilliant in their raw form. They're brilliant in the telling. They're brilliant in the recognition of the value. They're brilliant in pulling a little insight out of the story. And when, you know, when I work with people, when, I, when we work on our accelerator, the breakthrough thing that people discover is not Bitcoin or it's not um, some click funnels software that's been missing from their life. The breakthrough thing is that they recognize that their story is valuable. They recognize they have insights, networks, ideas that they've been taking for granted and that they're not leveraging those. Now, once you've got those, great. Stick a click funnel on it if that is applicable. You know, fantastic. You know, wrap some new technology around it. You know, accept Bitcoin, whatever. But the recognition of value in yourself is a is a is a key thing. And it's not like a it's not like a being on yourself. It's just looking at your own story and saying, "This is the raw material I've got to work with. Let's make something of it. Let's let's uh, let's do something with it." And it's often having someone else who can help you gain some perspective. It's like, "Whoa, don't skip over that. That's an interesting. That's that's an interesting insight." Yeah, I think the interesting thing, Daniel, is you talk about the KPI being a set of skills that you can learn. Now, 
in our business, George and I are very much looking at an integrator and a visionary role. Like I hold the visionary, George holds the integrator. How does an integrator fit into that KPI paradigm as such? So you'll, you'll see this again and again that um, these magical duos uh, form that you don't get a Steve Jobs without a Wozniak and then you don't get a Steve Jobs without a Tim Cook. Um, and then you don't get the same Apple when you lose the Steve Jobs and the, and the Tim Cook is the, the guy who's left. You get a great Apple, but you don't get the same Apple. Um, you, you, know, you get someone like Elon Musk who is quite clearly lacking an equal and opposite integrator and ends up doing dumb shit and ends up going crazy with visionary stuff and almost risks imploding the business many times. And, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that he was, he's quite literally a Leonardo da Vinci level um, engineer uh, and thinker. And, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, he, he, if it wasn't for sheer brilliance on his part, you would have a business that imploded long ago. Um, and could you imagine what Elon Musk could accomplish if he actually had a, a visionary integrator, oh, sorry, an integrator who is at the same level as his, you know, a Tim Cook to his um, Steve Jobs. Uh, Bill Gates took over when he found um, Steve Ballmer and uh, initially Paul Allen and then Steve Ballmer. Um, and Bill Gates was an introvert, a very much a rationalist, um, and Steve Ballmer was this crazy emotional hype guy who took a bunch of engineers and made them feel that they were building the future and got them excited and basically made them feel like rock stars for creating software. And it was that energy of Bill Gates's brain and Steve Ballmer's heart and passion um, that, that kind of created 25 years of Microsoft success that probably wasn't necessarily the most likely company to succeed mm. i think team building is an exciting thing to to drop into because i know george it's a big thing for you looking at the structure of a team and how we can transition from being that solopreneur to that team so george i know you've got a take on this and you've got some things that you love to delve into yeah so it's like starting off we work with a lot of people that are, i guess solopreneurs they're doing everything themselves yeah. like we started off that way as well like Learned everything we could ourselves, did everything ourselves, we did the marketing, we did the sales, we did the fulfillment. So how do, how do you take a jump from being that person to actually having a small team? Because you talk about you know, a lifestyle business, you have four <coughs> key people. And yeah. how do you make that jump, for instance, when money's tight? So, um, so for starters, I'll be really harsh. I'm just going to be brutal you're not really an entrepreneur if you're by yourself. You're not. You might be ambitious. You might be in business. You might be self-employed. Um, but entrepreneurship is a team sport. If I told you I'm a, uh, a footballer, but I just all I do is I play solo, I'm just by myself footballer, you'd say, well, football's a team sport. Like, and I go, yeah, but I'm, like, I'm really good. I'm kicking the ball around. I'm having a having a great time, I could, you know, bounce the ball off my knee and off my head and I can kick goals and I practice and I drill and I read books about football and I watch football videos and all that sort of stuff. I'm a footballer, right? I go, no, you're a footballer when you join a team. Like that's, you know, it's, it's just that simple. You're not a footballer if you're not on a team. Um, you're not an entrepreneur if you're not on a team. Um, it's a team sport. It really is. It's anything that's complex is a team sport. You just can't do it by yourself. You can survive, human beings can survive by ourselves, right? Uh, in fact, it's a discipline, it's a skill. Like Bear Grylls, you go out into the wild and you try and survive for two or three weeks by yourself. I mean, it's one hell of an achievement to just feed yourself by yourself. Um, you know, we make TV shows about one person who goes into the wild by themselves and doesn't die. Like that's an achievement, just not dying. Um, and yet, place us into groups. We're a social animal. Put, it, put us into societies and we send rocket ships up into the atmosphere. We've got 14 people living on the ISS right now. Um, 
you, you know, we're creating insane technology and insane problems on the planet. We did that. We do that as teams. We don't do that as by ourselves. By ourselves, we're a very pathetic little animal um, that doesn't have a, a huge place in the animal kingdom. Um, as a team, we're very, very powerful. So um, in entrepreneurship, it's the same. You're not, you're not actually being an entrepreneur unless you're building a team. So consider this. Let's say we wanted to rob a bank. Um, we recognize that there's a bank down the road. We know that the guard changes at 2 to 2.30, and, and it's a really pathetic, inept, inept guard who's on the evening shift, and there's all this cash lying around, and right, typical stuff that you see in the movies. And I say, I say to myself, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it all myself because I think I don't want to sh- split the money with anyone. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to kind of go in there with with a shotgun, and then I want to hold everyone up, and then I want to steal the money and put it into the bag, and then I want to go out and drive the car myself, right? Because it's just, you know, I'm going to make more money that way. You say, well, realistically, you're probably going to get caught. Right? You're just never going to succeed. Um, as opposed to if I worked with three or four people who have robbed lots of banks and we sit around having pizzas and beers and we talk about it and talk about it and we stake it out together and we sit there in the car with the binoculars watching for a week and we go and have another beer and a pizza and talk it through and talk it through and talk it through until such time as it feels inevitable, until such time as we go – We've got this thing sorted. Like, I know what we're going to do. You're going to go in there and you're going to crack the safe and you're going to do this intimidating thing and you're going to drive the car and, right, like, we, we, it's inevitable. We've thought through everything from every angle. One of us is optimistic and the other one's pessimistic. The other, then this one's got optimism and this one's pessimistic. And we come to agreements on stuff and we actually go, you know what, we've got this thing sorted. And that's why bank robbery movies are always a bunch of people sitting around talking about it until it feels inevitable. And it's the same with entrepreneurs. You sit around talking about it until it feels inevitable. Um, you find the guy who's really experienced in selling and you, you, you talk, you, you meet after work and you meet before work and you try and figure out how he's going to make the sales and what he needs in order to make the sales. How many leads a week do you need in order to make 14 sales? Oh, I need 80 leads, fresh leads. Okay, great. Um, wow, we better figure out how to get 80 leads a week. Um, well, we know this guy who uh, who's really good at generating leads on Facebook. Uh, how much do you need to spend in order to get 80 leads a week? Well, it's about 20 pounds a lead. Okay, so we need a budget of 1,600 pounds a week in order to do that. Where are we going to get 1,600 pounds from? Well, actually, I know someone who's come into a bit of money and they've got a bit of money. They want to invest. Um, you know, maybe we get a little bit of seed capital, 15,000, and and we give them a return on investment. Um, if we pay it back with interest in the first 12 months, then we clear the debt, and if not, they, they get equity each month. We structure a deal. And if all of that sounds too hard, if honestly, if all of that sounds hard, then you're not the person to lead the team. You're just not ready. So in which case, go join someone else's. Go jump on a team that inspires you. Go go do a year in sales on someone else's team. Go do a year sweeping the floor in someone else's team. Right, Work your way up. Um, if you're sitting there going, oh, but how would I have a conversation with someone about 15 grand? Great, you're not ready. Go talk to someone who's who's already raising funds. I didn't start out knowing what to do. I went and worked under John's wing for two years. Yeah, and for me, that was a huge payoff. Like when I look at that story, it's something I regret. I massively regret. I was too egotistic, egotistical in my early stages when I left my corporate to be like, I know this shit. I'm going to go in and just make it work which is a really dumb way of looking at it. And I think that's the curse of a lot of entrepreneur or so-called entrepreneurs, if you want to call it, is that we're not at the level that we think we are. And it's this trendy thing right now where we want to be the entrepreneur and everyone's diving into it. But really, we haven't got the mental capacity, fortitude, toughness, ability experience. to absorb risk. Just, put, just play an experience. Yeah. You know, you don't get to be the captain of the football team on your first game. Um, you just don't. Uh, you know, you you join and you sit on the bench and you wait for a small opportunity to play and then you play really well and you, you get to play more games. Um, yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people who are starting starting out in businesses. The other thing too is there's this misconception that you're either in corporate or you're starting a business. There's 5.7 million businesses out there. Um, half of those are employing people. 
like they're little businesses, they're teams of three or four. Go find a little business that inspires you, a team of five or six people and say, listen, I'm willing to work cheaply or even perhaps free for a little bit in order to join the team, in order to prove that I'm worth something to this team. And I promise that will actually pay off more than the money you'll lose trying to start a business um, without the experience. So everyone's kind of like, oh, well, I either go and work for Merrill Lynch or I go and start my own business. It's like, whoa, let's let's go work on a team of 10 people. See how you go, see how you go working closely with an entrepreneur, adding value to a team. Right, Daniel. So I want to take a bit of a segue right now and I want to talk about the entrepreneur journey because it's something that fascinates George and I and it's a concept that's linked to your books innately and one of the sub questions I want to ask around the entrepreneur journey and the four books that you have got published right now, uh, was it written in a series in order to form that journey or was it something that just fell into place? <laughs> yeah, I, I woke up one day and it just hit me like a bolt of lightning. Um, so uh, two things have happened. My entrepreneur journey has unfolded a particular way. Um, and I experienced things across my journey that I, I thought, gee, I wonder if other people are experiencing this problem at this particular moment. And then I worked with 3,000 companies um, with Dent, you know, across, you know, obviously extended through our team, but I personally have worked with hundreds and hundreds of companies. And you just see the pattern. You just see it everywhere. Um, and, um, and you realize that it's, a, it's as predictable as... Um, you know, the journey that someone would go through to become a professional sports person or the journey someone would go through in order to become a doctor. Um, you know, there, if you were to say, you know, I'm going to be a, a doctor, it's like, okay, you're going to do this medical school, you're going to need to get these grades, then you're going to do this amount of time, um, you know, working as a junior and then you're going to work your way up and you're going to need these kind of experiences and this is, there's there's this way of getting stuck where you never break out of this and you know and you go oh actually all these doctors have got a very predictable kind of past they've all had certain experiences so it was very similar i just kind of picked out the the running themes of all you know all or most entrepreneurs um and 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 it matched up with my experience and because i was writing the books looking at my last few years so um, i actually wrote most of entrepreneur revolution first um, but left it on my hard drive, key person of influence became a much more valuable concept and much more valuable idea that people were interested in. I launched the book Key Person of Influence um, uh, as my first book, but it was actually the second one that I wrote. Um, after that was out, I already had 15,000 words worth of Entrepreneur Revolution written, which was essentially all of those stories in Entrepreneur Revolution are, are the stories of me getting started and working on as my mentor and then going and starting my first company. So I'd written all of that, but then I'd just come straight in and done key person of influence. Um, and then once you, once you've established a bit of a brand or you're working with key people of influence, you want to leverage that. So you run campaigns and promotions, you come up against your capacity, you get oversubscribed. So I wrote, I was writing about that because my main focus was running campaigns and promotions. Um, and then you have a business that's very much all about you and it's all on your shoulders and you feel the pressure of being that key person of influence. You feel the pressure of being an influencer um, and you, there's too many opportunities and you're thinking about how do I kind of make this less about me and more about a business. So I, I was trying to basically build out a business that would perform predictably in Australia, Singapore, UK and the USA all at once um, while I was having three children. And I start, stumbled across, upon this idea of, um, uh, 24 assets and the fact that you actually there's these 24 things that you need where I'm at right now is I want what is a very successful model to continue to double and I want a nice consistent doubling speed I want it to go from you know 5 million pounds to 10 million pounds 10 million pounds to 20 million pounds and I don't want it to be a linear journey I want it to be an exponential or progressive journey where it takes just as much energy and time to go from 5 to 10 as 10 to 20 or 20 to 40 which is the way computing speed has doubled or you know it's an exponential growth so it has to be digital it has to scale across digital platforms so my current book that I'm writing is called doubling speed which is looking at how do you build a business that maintains a consistent doubling speed so 
entrepreneur revolution, getting into business, key person of influence, establishing yourself as an influencer, someone who can attract business rather than chase business, um, oversubscribed, leveraging that person into campaigns, 20 for assets, building it out into a business, doubling speed, maintaining the momentum and, and having a business that just keeps cracking on. Wow, man. So I want to go into those in a little bit more detail on the importance of writing books. I'm sure you've spoken about this a million, hundred, how many times, an awful lot, book writing. Yep. yep. Can you sum up to us very briefly why it's still relevant today, even in the digital world, that we should be writing books? Yeah, well, it would be relevant even if you didn't launch the book, if you didn't release the book. Um, if all you did was, uh, I mean, Marcus Aurelius wrote, meditations without any intention his intention was for it to be burned and then they went against his wishes and published uh the thinking of a of a roman emperor um and you know he's he you know he wrote he wrote meditations as a way of processing his thinking and and capturing his learnings so i wrote all of my books as a way of processing my thinking and capturing my learnings and it just so happens that they're a really great tool for building business as well and getting to know a lot of people and connecting with a lot of people and um, actually in the digital environment it's a rocket rocket power for a book because the book ends up in audible books it ends up in blink list books it ends up um, on three or four different platforms it ends up in bookstores but it also ends up on people's kindles and and all of that sort of stuff the imagery of the book gets shared on uh, Instagram, it gets tweeted about, it gets blogged about. So the digital environment actually scales um, a book uh, exponentially more than it used to. Um, and uh, you end up with intellectual property that's truly your own. Just by writing a book, you end up with a, a new asset called copyright. Um, you own that automatically. Um, you suddenly have a format of something that can reach out and talk to people. Um, and the, the the phrase that captures it all is this phrase that I love to, to to share with people, which is the book that changes your life is not one you read. It's one that you write. And it's, you know, you can read book after book after book after book, but ultimately it's only when you produce something. It's only when you create something that you end up moving your life forward. Um, if all you did was read, um, you could potentially not move forward at all. You could just waste a lot of time reading up on people um, it's actually the creation of something. So a book is something we can go off and create. You know, it's it's probably an easier project than creating a company or creating a culture um, or creating you know a new new piece of technology. Uh, it's something that most people can kind of sit down and 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 it's a project that that is achievable. That concept's really intriguing, and I guess it links to the idea that you spoke about earlier, where you're like, on, not entrepreneurship, but mindset in the traditional form, how we think of it, isn't actually as productive as we like to think. And it's the same thing with the book writing. Sitting and reading books might feel good, but is it really delivering a result? And I think that's a refreshing way to look at the reality. And like you've said oh. in this, this, this interview the whole time, entrepreneurship isn't for everyone. Even though you're here speaking about entrepreneurship, it's your life, your businesses, uh, it's everything yeah. for you. It's certainly not for everyone at this particular, for this particular moment in time, maybe it's for you later. The average age that somebody employs someone is 45. Um, the average age that somebody starts a business is 37, 38. Um, you know, so, and the average age someone sells a business for more than a million is 54. So um, it's not necessarily that it won't ever happen, but for some people, you, you know, you're wanting too much too soon. Um, or you're wanting, you know, a big result too soon. You're not putting in the early doubles, um, so you're not willing to make something go from 50 grand to 100 grand because you want it. You want to find something that will do five million. Um, you know, so you know those those sorts of things um, happen. But yeah, the the issue with books, I I have a real. You have to keep yourself in check. Um, consumption is the enemy, and production is is where you're at is where you make your life. So if you take the Beatles, the Beatles wrote, recorded, produced, and released, on average, a new song every 12 days for eight years. That's the Beatles catalog. It's a new song in the marketplace every 12 days for eight years straight. Um, they weren't geniuses. They were just prolific in their output. They just got on with putting songs in the marketplace. Not all of them were number ones. Not all of them were top tens. Um, they just threw enough mud at the wall that some of it's, you know, stuck. Um, and these guys were in their early 20s. They weren't 
they weren't um, uh, they weren't sitting there saying, I've got to read a bunch of books and listen to a bunch of music before I can produce something. They were actually out there producing. So, um, you know, on the one side, I'm saying entrepreneurship often happens when people are older and they've got the experience, they've got the networks and the contacts. On the other side, a lot of great stuff happens for young people in their 20s if they're willing to produce, if they're willing to prolifically produce. And they have to be willing to produce the good and the bad. They have to be pr- willing to produce bad ideas as well as in order to get the good ideas. You've got to write some bad songs in order to write some good songs. Um, you know, so um, uh, Einstein Craig came up with the theory of relativity at age 26, but he wrote 300 scientific papers um, across his life. You know, um, uh, you know, I can give you example after example of people who were prolific um, and, and, and some good stuff came out of it. I think the fascinating thing about the Beatles story, which a lot of people probably don't know, and this relates to what you're talking about, Branson, it's, it's about Jobs and everyone else, is that the Beatles were in the States for a very long time playing the same show in the same venue for eight hours a night. And they were forced yeah. to write new co- content, new songs, because they couldn't keep playing the same stuff. So they were in an, in an environment that dictated success. Yeah, they, they, um, they had this, uh, before they became the Beatles, they were in Hamburg in a strip club. Yep. Um, doing really long shifts um, on methamphetamine uh, <laughs> in order to in order to play for that length of time, and yeah, they had to just learn different styles and they had to learn how to be a band, um, you know. And and the reason they became the Beatles is because they did that crazy stint, and then when they came back to Liverpool, had they come back to London, they wouldn't have stood out. But when they came back to Liverpool, they were the best, tightest act that anyone had seen. They were so comfortable on stage and charismatic on stage because they just it wasn't a big deal for them. And then when you know that that's that's really where it took off. That, but they put in they put in some real time becoming the Beatles. Yeah, they were forced to do so. Amazing. Yeah, I find I find it interesting when you say that they came back to Liverpool. So they, they obviously it's where they were from. But with regards to an online business. Would you say there's a, like how much relevance is there in picking a specific location to actually run the business or mm. operate it from? So today, the Liverpool is a micro niche. So in a geographical society, a micro niche means becoming the best in a small town. Um, and you'll find that a lot of professional athletes actually came out of uh, small towns as well because they became the best in a small town and that allowed them to then get noticed and then they became best in bigger towns and bigger towns. Um, a lot of them don't uh, start in cities because it's very hard to get noticed in a big city. Um, so what happened is in, in a time when geography was the most important thing, a niche is being best in a small town. Um, when we live in a global society where digital makes everything accessible to everyone globally, being the best in a small town means being the best in your niche. So rather than um, being a fitness trainer, personal trainer, you might be a an expert in getting people who are above 25 BMI to below 25 BMI. Um, so clinically obese or obese into overweight might actually be, and it might be for men over 40. And it might, you know, another niche might be working with skinny dads who want arms and chest. Right. Another one might be um, working with night shift workers, uh, you know, who uh, who have very different hours. Another one might be um, working exclusively with models who need a very particular aesthetic. Um, you know, another one might be working with, um, uh, you know, really, really high paid uh, people who travel all the time who are at least a gold frequent flyer on two airlines. Got it. Would you, would you, uh, as that business, would you ever consider that it is relevant to be in a certain location? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a constant, if you, as soon as you go into a niche, you're probably going to find, uh, that you need a concentration of people. You either need to have a digital delivery model or you'll need a concentration of people. So it's very easy to go into a micro niche when you live in a big city. Um, because if you said, I'm going to only work with uh, single mums who work at one of the big four accounting firms, they're in a big city, there's probably a few thousand of those. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you do that 
in a small town, there's, there's just not going to be any, um, or you might not find them. Um, you know, Facebook is an incredible thing that just allows you to find different niches and different, you know, you can go on Facebook and find groups that already exist of thousands of people who do weird, wonderful things, right? And, um, you, you know, you can find uh, an entire group of people who absolutely passionate about free diving, holding their breath for as long as they possibly can. And, you know, they time each other and they discuss the absolute genius of free diving. Um, you know, they've got their heroes, um, they've got their equipment, they've got all of this sort of stuff, in which case maybe becoming a fitness trainer for people who free dive to extend, you know, lung capacity is the most important thing. You know, there, there are the, the groups are already there. The micro niches are already there. The little towns and cities have already been put together. So it's about turning up and being, um, you know, being able to play the tune that they're all interested in. So Daniel, we want to wrap things up now and respect your time today. It's been incredibly insightful. But before you go, there's a couple of things. The first thing is, where can the guys get hold of you? What's happening in 2019 for Daniel and Dent and all the other companies you're involved in? Um, where do the guys start out? Well, don't get a hold of me. I'm busy. <laughs> You're not having another kid, are you? <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, the, the best place to start is my books. Um, once, you've, um, once you've had a read of uh, Key Person of Influence, there's a scorecard in there, Key Person of Influence scorecard, and it's going to ask you some very direct questions about are you doing this or are you not doing this? Are you... Um, you know, you can't wiggle out of most of the questions. It's you, you either have this thing, you know, happening or you don't. Um, and it'll end up giving you a score, maybe a little bit of a depressing score, but it'll give you a score, a starting point. And then it'll give you a report of some key things to go and focus on. Um, and uh, for us, if people score between a 15 and a 55, we're particularly interested in having a conversation with them and interviewing them um, for one of our accelerators. Scoring between 15 and 55% on our um, scorecard. If you're under 15%, it's probably too, it, chances are it's too early stage. There's not enough of a platform. If you're over 55%, you're probably doing a lot of what we talk about on that particular accelerator. Uh, um, but yeah, essentially when people score between 15 and 55% on the um, scorecard, there's a really good platform for growth and plenty of room to just kind of some low hanging fruit that will you know, accelerate their business very rapidly. Um, and then um, in London, regularly I give talks or I do strategy sessions that allow people to connect and we spend time and we discuss the strategies and we discuss their business, where they want to be three years from now um, and, and basically go through all of that. Um, we also run this in Sydney and we, you know, Melbourne and Brisbane and in Florida. And so, you know, we've got people all over the place. So, um, yeah, so people can get in touch with us. We can also do it on Skype. Um, but it starts with have a read of the have a read of key person of influence, do the scorecard. If that's resonating, um, then the uh, the machine we've built will take over. <laughs> the machine, I love it. And the final question, Daniel, unless George, you got something else to jump in? Oh, nope, all good. You sure? Awesome. So, uh, what does freedom mean to you? Um, it's an interesting question because. Um, Freedoms a little, can often be a little bit of a juvenile idea. Um, so really commonly I hear people say, I want financial freedom. And I go, yeah, it's not going to feel like that when you've got it. So financial freedom is the ability to deal with financial complexity and make it look effortless. Uh, so what, when you end up with, some money you're going to have to invest it you're going to have to um use it wisely a ton of people are going to come out of the woodwork in order to ask you um and the, you know offer you an opportunity that involves your money so you know as a younger guy i invested in really dumb shit because it sounded cool and i lost 20 grand here and 20 grand there and um you know it was just i didn't have i, I got money quickly but didn't have the uh, correlating skills to discern what was a good investment or not. Um, so the reality of financial freedom is um, having insights, having uh, skills, having um, the ability to take on the responsibility of, of money uh, as much as it is being able to jump on a plane and travel wherever you want to travel and 
hang out with whoever you want to hang out with and start a business if you want to start a business. But the reality of it is that it's it's not a juvenile idea. It's a it's a responsibility as much as it is a freedom. Um, same thing, you know. Same thing goes with with pro, you know with anything that you place a high value on. Um, but um, you know, for you know, some of the fruits of freedom is getting to spend a lot of time with uh, kids. And you know, I've got three kids, and I spend a lot of time with them. Um, it's the ability to just say no to stuff that's not really something I really want to do. Um, the ability to, you know politely decline something that's 90% right, but not 100% right. Um, the ability to see the world, um, to get curious about a topic and run deep on it, um, to get inspired by something that I want to create and to have the resources to, to put into the creation of that. Um, but that would be some of the fruit that, fruit that that freedom has. But the one thing I want to avoid for anyone listening is the juvenile idea of freedom that freedom is like having a rich uncle who just throws cash at you so you can just go and do any dumb thing that comes into your head um, because, A, that's not going to happen, um, and, B, that kind of thinking doesn't produce the fruits of freedom that you've got in mind. Um, so you've you got to have a – you've got to lean into the responsibility of, uh, of freedom as well as the fruit that it produces. Yeah, it's a very stoic answer, Marcus Aurelius style answer. I like that. <laughs> it's a pain. In, it's a pain in the ass, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> Amazing. So, Daniel, thank you so much for your time today, and more than that, the work that you've put in over the last God knows how many years, and the amount of lives you've honestly changed. I remember explicitly on a moped in, on a scooter in Thailand, listening to key person of influence, and thinking. I need to speak to this guy one day. So thank you so much for taking the time out your, your diary awesome. today and getting to get to know you a little bit better. Yeah. And, and again, for me, thank you so much for, for coming and spending the day. Uh, it's, it's been awesome. And I had wanted to mention that the name of this show, Remote Revolution Show, was birthed about two weeks after you had read I didn't realize. The Entrepreneur Revolution. And we're, like, yeah. we're, we're trying to build this remote idea. Oh. I like it. Remote revolution. Yeah, it's cool. It works. So thank you. And it's working. It's absolutely <laughs> Here we are working. in Spain you with got the, team. the wine bottles to prove it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, amazing. So Daniel, man, thank you so much for your time today. We'll wrap this one up. Everyone go check out Daniel's work, his books, everything else that he does. He's an amazing guy. And uh, thank you. Cheers, legends. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Remote Revolution Show. If you enjoyed the show, please head across to iTunes, YouTube, and our other social media platforms to leave us a quick rating and review. And if you'd like your questions answering, we'd love to hear from you. So please send them into info at remoterevolutionshow.com. And please remember the show is all about growing the remote revolution. So if you wish to join the community and scale your business, then please head over to www.remoterevolutionshow.com or click the link in the show notes to grab our free download. Yes, seriously, don't be lazy. Click the link in the show notes and grab the downloads. And as always, we'll see you next week.